at this point i'd just like to raise an important question so do you know which is the most common healthcare associated bloodstream pathogen do you know do you know which pathogen is associated with the 47% attributable mortality it is also the third most common cause of healthcare associated bloodstream infection is it candida mrsa or pseudomonas all three seem to be arguably good choices to answer these questions but it is candida candida is the most commonly isolated healthcare associated bloodstream pathogen this is associated with 47% attributable mortality which is pretty high and it is the third most common cause of healthcare associated bloodstream infections so it is extremely important to know how to manage these infections so as we all know we can divide fungal infections into endemic mycosis and opportunistic mycosis now endemic mycosis are caused by fungal organisms which which are not usually part of human microbiota so often these infections are associated with certain specific activities like gardening for sporotrichosis or visit to certain specific places like for histoplasmosis and coccidioidomycosis now moving on to opportunistic mycosis which includes the more commonly encountered fungal infections like candidiasis and aspergillosis and all These infections are caused by fungal organisms which are commonly part of the human microbiota. Now, these are actually normal commensals which turn into invasive pathogens due to the host's ineffective immunity. Now, with the advent of immunosuppressive medications and post transplant, these infections have widely increased in number. even the endemic mycosis can cause more serious infections in the immunocompromised patients so fungal infections are generally caused by three different kinds of fungi first is the yeast now these yeasts are rounded single cells they are often seen as budding organisms the common examples in the yeast category include candida and cryptococcus Now cryptococcus occurs only as a yeast form both in the environment as well as in the tissue. However, when we come to candida on tissue invasion, this presents both as a budding yeast and as filamentous forms with hyphae and pseudo hyphae. The only exception is candida glabrata which presents only as yeast both in the environment and tissue. The next category of fungi include something called as molds. Now these molds have filamentous forms called hyphae. The important molds are Aspergillus and Rhizopus which includes the zygomycosis or the more common mucor. And finally we come to the dimorphic fungi. Now these dimorphic fungi they exist in the yeast form inside the tissues and in the environment they exist in the mold form with hyphae. Now some examples of dimorphic fungi include histoplasmosis, coccidioidomycosis, paracoccidioidomycosis, sporotrichosis, blastomycosis. So essentially most of the endemic mycosis that we just saw earlier come under the dimorphic fungi category. And molds and yeasts commonly include the fungi which are implicated in opportunistic infections. Now moving on to diagnosis Definitive diagnosis of a fungal infection is almost always based on histopathology where it is seen that the fungus is invading the tissue and this is often accompanied by an inflammatory response this is very important for fungi like aspergillus because this is often an ex vivo contaminant because this is so ubiquitously present in nature aspergillus can always be found in a lot of samples and in the absence of an accompanying inflammatory response or a consistent histopathology we cannot conclude that it is aspergillus infection this is why this is important The commonly used stains to diagnose fungal infections include periodic acid skiff, gummery methanamine silver, gram staining can pick up candida. We all know in India ink is traditionally used for cryptococcus. Moving on to diagnosis, antigen and antibody testing has also been done. Cryptococcal antigen testing has now replaced India ink detection and this can be done both in the serum and the CSF. Antibody testing is often found to be useful with respect to coccidioidomycosis and histoplasmosis of late these are two tests that have gained a lot of importance because they are looked at as surrogate markers of an underlying invasive fungal infection 
So one is the serum galactomannan, which is fairly specific for aspergillus, and the other is the serum 13 beta D glucan, which is specific for candida. You should understand that both these tests have high negative predictive value because there are a lot of other factors which could cause false positive results. If these tests are negative in a patient suspected with invasive fungal infection, then that may be taken as a, a good marker to guide us to stop empirical antifungals in such patients. Now, look, let's look at the basic principles of management of a fungal infection. So, as we all know, there are three important categories of antifungal agents. Uh, the oldest and the one with the broadest spectrum is the amphotericin B. Next is the azoles and finally we have echinocandins. Let's look at each of them a little more in detail. Now, amphotericin B belongs to the group called polyenes. Now, polyenes, how do they act? The polyenes bind to ergosterol in the fungal cell membrane and they create channels which cause cytoplasmic leakage. So, amphotericin B is actually fungicidal. It is the broadest spectrum antifungal available. And the adverse effects include nephrotoxicity, diselectrolytemia and infusion reaction. And these adverse effects often limit the use of amphotericin B. The newer formulations of amphotericin B which have tried to circumvent these toxicities include the liposomal amphotericin B which is given at a dosage of 3 to 5 mg per kg per day as opposed to a dose of 0.7 to 1 mg per kg per day for the conventional amphotericin B deoxycholate. Now next is the amphotericin B lipid complex which is given at a dose of 5 mg per kg per day and finally we have the amphotericin B colloidal dispersion which is given at a dosage of 3 to 4 mg per kg per day. The first two are more popular, they have lesser side effects and hence are more widely used but they are very very expensive.